Thank you for joining us this morning for our Sunday morning worship at the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. I realize that you have options on what to do with your time, and I'm so thankful that you chose to give a listen this morning uh, or whenever you might be listening. When uh, this pandemic season is over, whoever you might be, wherever you are, if you're in the city of Memphis, you're invited to join us at 1667 South Lauderdale Street in Memphis, Tennessee, where our worship starts promptly at 1015 each Sunday morning. Our text for today is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Isaiah chapter 3, 4, verses 3 and 4. It reads, and I'm reading from the message version. Uh, Everyone left behind in Zion all the discards and rejects in Jerusalem will be reclassified as holy, alive, and therefore precious. And God will give Zion's women a good bath. He'll scrub the blood-stained city of its violence and brutality and purge the place with a firestorm of judgment. Today I want to use for a subject the holiness and purity is making the right choice. Holiness and purity is making the right choices to make it simple. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would use your living word uh, this morning that is spoken through these lips of clay and teach us to make the right choices in life for the purpose of being holy and pure. In the holy and pure name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. To be holy is to be set apart for the Lord's use. And in practical application, the way that we can do that is simply by making the right choices. It's impossible for us on our own to make the right choices, so we must have the help and assistance from God through his Holy Spirit if we ever want to be successful at making the right choices. One of mankind's major problem is choosing to be what God has chosen us to be. God chose us not based upon what or who we are, but based upon the people that he would one day make us without controlling our moral will. God did create us or make us as free moral agents. He created us so that we could and gave us the right to make our own choices. However, we must always realize that assistance in making the right choices is always available from God, and he always maintained control of the outcome of our choices. God does not treat us like puppets and hold us by a string controlling us, nor is he treating us like a puppet that has his hands up our back and controlling us that way. But let's get more uh, get a more precise meaning of a puppet before we go further. A puppet is a movable model of a person or animal that is used in entertainment. God does not need us to entertain him and is typically moved either by strings controlled from above or by hands inside of it. There are people that are controlled by other people from above them. They cannot move without being told to jump or how high to jump. They are as though someone had their hands inside of them moving them or is controlling them from, by pulling a string. They are only allowed to say what they are instructed to say. God chose to allow us to be free to make our own moral judgment or choices. From the beginning, it was proven that we, mankind, needed help. And God has chosen to help, give us that help, 
uh, from on a day by day basis, situation by situation, we are being set free from the power of sin by the power of the Holy Spirit as he helps us to make the right choices. God says, come, let us reason together. In other words, God is saying, I want to help you to make the right choices. I want to, to in one hand, show you the cons of your choice, and then in the other hand, the pros of your choices. I want to show you what can go wrong if you make the wrong choices. I want to show you what how you can be blessed by making the right choice. Job chapter 11 verse 20 says, but the wicked shall find no way to escape. Their only hope is death. And, and it is amazing that all have sinned and come short of God's glory. In other words, we all have chosen death. But now we have an opportunity to choose life. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, and this is the Living Bible version, it says, but remember this, the wrong desires that come into your life aren't anything new or different. Many others have faced exactly the same problems that you are. And no temptation is irresistible. But you can trust God to keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. For he has promised this and will do what he says. He will show you how to escape temptation's power so that you can bear up patiently against it. In other words, God will provide us a way of escape from every temptation we are faced with. We are at our best learning to accept God's way. Proverbs uh, 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Verse 6 and 7 say, In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. And be not wise in thine own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. And then uh, those same verses in uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse uh, 5 through 7 in the message version reads like this. Trust God from the bottom of your heart and don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God and run from evil. Have you ever been involved in a matter that you didn't realize what really was going on? There are days that go by and I fail to notice the Holy Spirit at work in me and on my behalf, teaching me to decrease so that Jesus may increase in me. In other words, he's helping me to, to not try to figure it out myself, not try to make my own choices because I'm learning that the choices I make without the Holy Spirit will always end up being the wrong choice. Our goal should be to hear our Heavenly Father's voice refer to us in the same way that he referred to his son Jesus when he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Our goal should be working towards hearing God say those very words about us. The Holy Spirit is tasked with making this happen. He's at work constantly transforming our minds. Romans 12 and one and two says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, it's not too much for God to ask of us. Verse two says, and being not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All of our, our choices are self-centered. It's mostly about what I want or what I desire in life. But God's choices are threefold. First, his attention is on us. And then it's on others. And then on his desires. So our desires should be, first of all, on others. By way of God, what God desires for us. And then we don't really have to worry about what we want. We don't have to ch make choices that's going to give us what we want because God will take care of us if we make the right choices on the front end. Psalms 8, uh, 8 chapter verse 4 uh, through 6 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hand, and thou hast put all things under his feet. Psalms 144 verse 3 says, O Lord, who are you that you should notice us? Mere mortals, that you should care for us. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that the Lord cares about me. Now, uh, he also wants us to care about others. Philippians, 4, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 through uh, verse, uh, verse uh, 11 and the New International Version. That's Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 through 11. It reads, each of you should... Look not only on your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, even the death on the cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and, 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 and placed him in a high place and given him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now when it comes to a de definition of holiness, it means to be set apart. It means to be, sac be means sacredness or separated or set apart for God's use. There was a holy remnant that God set apart in Israel for himself. And God will always have a remnant for himself. Holy means what is separated from the world and superior to it. The congregation of the saints or holy ones who now inhabit Jerusalem are what remained after a melting away the outer to expose the inner beauty and purity. Their holiness is the consequences of a washing. And I like to say right here, that ask the question, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I'm glad that I've been washed by the blood of the lamb. God has never left the world without a nucleus of heaven. He has drowned the world, but left a seed to build an altar. 
He has burned uh, the Gomorrahs of the world, but he has allowed the faithful to escape and to become the beginning of a new offspring. There's always a remnant left. One, the, the one left, the true heart, the faithful among the faithless. Now, now holiness becomes believers. We are told that there's a little creature called the ermine. And it is so sensitive to its own cleanliness that it becomes paralyzed and powerless at the slightest touch of defilement upon its snow white fur. A like sensibility should belong to we Christians who should abstain from the very appearance of evil. Holy is moral and ethical wholeness or perfection, freedom from moral evil. Holiness is one of the essential elements of God's nature required of his people. Holiness may also be rendered sanctification or godliness. The word holy denotes that which is sanctified or set apart for a divine purpose. God instructed Moses to consecrate Aaron and his sons in Exodus 29 and 9 to the priesthood. The children of Israel were admonished to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Exodus 20 and 8. Elisha was called a holy man of God in 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 9. Herod the king feared John the Baptist knowing that he was a just and holy man in Mark 6 and 20. While holy is sometimes used in a ceremonial sense, the main use is to describe God's righteous nature or the ethical righteousness demanded of his followers. Originating in God's nature, holiness is a unique quality of his character. And God is calling us to allow holiness to be a unique part of our character. The Bible emphasizes this divine attribute. Who is like you, O Lord? There is none like you, Lord. 1 Samuel 2 and 2. Who shall not fear you, O Lord? For you alone are holy. Revelation 15 and 4. Jesus was the very personification of holiness. He reinforced God's demand for holiness by insisting that his disciples must have a higher quality of righteousness than that of the scribes and Pharisees, Matthews 5 and 20. Like the prophet Amos and Hosea, Jesus appealed for more than ceremonial holiness. He desires mercy and not sacrifices. The theme of sanctification or growing into God's likeness and being consecrated for his use is prominent throughout the Bible. Like Jesus, the Apostle Paul taught that sanctification or true holiness expressed itself in patience and in love, sacrifice while awaiting the Lord's return. Peter urged the suffering church of the Roman Empire to follow God's example of holiness in their trials and tribulations. As he who is called has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. 1 Peter 1 and 15. Paul's prayer for the saints at Thessalonica is timely in its application to the church and individual believers. And may the Lord, he says, make you increase in love and abound in love so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father 
at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. Isaiah chapter 4, our text, verse 3 and 4, deals with the divine judgment that God will bring on Israel in the future, in the time of tribulation, and will have a purifying effect on many of them. So the lesson is, when life seems hard and difficult to us, we should not fret or complain because God just might be working to bring about a rich harvest in us. He just might be working to prepare us to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto himself. And those left alive in Israel, to the end of the holy is conduct as well as being set apart by God for his purpose. Similarly, God purified the Israelites through their oppressions in Egypt and then liberated them so that they could be a holy nation in calling and in conduct. In both cases, God himself did it. Jesus came down through 42 corrupt generations, born in a manger in Bethlehem, reared in Nazareth. And you know what they, act, they, they stay, say it about Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He was baptized in the Jordan. He healed the sick and gave sight to the blind. He loosed stammering tongues, raised the dead, and, and he's still working wondrous miracles in the world today. On his way to the cross, he spent some agonizing moments in the Garden of Gethsemane. Can you hear him? In Luke chapter 22, verse 42, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. He's agonizing between the wrong choice and the right choice. And I love it when, he's, when, when, when he reached the, the wherewithal. He resolved to make the right choice. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And we as followers of Jesus Christ have got to learn to, to say not my choice, but your choice for me. He put, on, he put others before himself and then the ultimate victory. God's will over his will. He died and was buried. But early the third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and in earth in his hand. The Holy Spirit is waiting to help us to make the right choices. And he will reason with us, showing us the consequences of the wrong choices versus the blessings of the right choice. When we choose to obey God, it will always be a blessing to us. But when we choose to go our own way, it will be a curse to us. And we are constantly having to make choices in life. What choice? What do you make? I pray that these words will help you to depend on the Holy Spirit to make the right choices. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today, and we pray now that you would give the increase that each time we are faced with making a choice in life, 
that we will remember that we're not alone. You're not, you have not left us to figure it out on our own, but you're right with us and you are there hoping that we will ask you for help in making the right choices. We love to be victorious, so help us to make the right choices so that we can be victorious. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, may God bless you and keep you, and I pray that, and I know he will, at the appropriate time, give the increase that you will be able to make good choices in life. I love you, God loves you, and let's keep traveling up the King's Highway together making the right choices. So long. Take care.